Did you know that God wants to be good to you? It says in Isaiah 30 that the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. Let's sing about his goodness. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing about your mercy. Psalm 34, 3 says, Come, let us tell the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Let us sing together this morning. This is Amazing Grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger?
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Tenasket Free Methodist Church. We're glad you're here. Uh, we value worshiping God, we value loving people, and we value making disciples. We love that you've come because uh, right now we get to take an, an opportunity to pause and do something special for kids. So we want to welcome you to... Kids! Kids Church! <laughs> welcome kids to Kids Church! Church. <laughs> I think you forgot what he was supposed to do. Well, today in Pastor Ryan's message, he's talking about Daniel chapter 4. He's been in this, this uh, series called Unshakable because of Daniel's faith during this hard time he goes through. Well, chapter 4 is really interesting. It's not about Daniel or his friends. It's about someone else. It's about the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And one thing you'll hear Pastor Ryan talk about is that King Nebuchadnezzar struggles with pride. Guys, what's pride? What do you guys think pride is? I want you to turn to your parents and tell them what your definition of pride is. Like if you do something and you're really like excited about it. You, having pride in something you do? Mm. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Finney? Um, I don't know. Finn doesn't know. Maverick said, uh, it's like being excited about something you've done. That's like being proud of something you've accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, the Bible talks about two different types of pride. One of them's okay, and one of them's not okay. The one Maverick was talking about being proud of something you've accomplished, like maybe you did a really hard homework assignment, or maybe you drew this awesome picture, or uh, like when I go fishing, I'm really proud when I catch a really big fish, and each time I tell the story, the fish gets bigger and bigger. I get really proud of some things I've done, and maybe you have experienced that same thing, but there's a different type of pride that's bad. And this is the type of pride that King Nebuchadnezzar struggled with. There's the pride that you're better than other people, or even that you're better than God, that you don't need God. That type of pride is not good. See, uh, when I'm going to ask Crystal to blow a bubble, because there's this verse in Proverbs that says that there's, we'll see if she can do it on cue. Uh, there's this verse on, in Proverbs that talks about that there is pride before the fall or pride before destruction. And that's talking about that type of pride that King Nebuchadnezzar struggled with. See, having pride is okay, that pride that you've done something good, and that's like blowing up this bubble. But when you have too much pride, it pops. That's what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. You'll hear about it in Pastor Ryan's message. So that's what I want you to remember. These two different prides, one is being proud of something you accomplished. The other one, like Proverbs says, leads to destruction. And kind of like this balloon, when you have too much of it, eventually you pop. Okay, we love you guys. We can't wait to talk to you soon. Um, uh, I'm going to read Pastor Ryan's scripture for you today. It's Daniel chapter 4, and I'll start in verse 1. Um, you guys have just a minute to open your Bibles and get ready. Good morning, everyone. And you just heard uh, a fun little... Uh, kids illustration on pride from me. And I told you I'd be reading uh, the scripture for Pastor Ryan today. It's Daniel 4, 1 through 33. We decided this week to record. I'm going to tell you this while I wait for you guys to open your Bible if you'd like to follow along. We decided to record in front of the kids church sign that we have because uh, we just wanted you kids to know we miss you guys. We miss seeing you. and We miss hearing your little feet running upstairs and the way you guys dance. And we miss all the little signs from when you guys would come and uh, worship God your own little way. So we just want you guys to know we miss you, we love you, and we can't wait to see you. Okay, starting in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and viners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, 
Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under, in, uh, under it, the beasts of the field found shelter and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw uh, while lying in my bed, I looked and there before me was a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground and the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plant, plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given to the mind of an animal till seven times has seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belshazzar, tell me what it means for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies uh, and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger a holy one coming down from heaven saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by, pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree. The Most High has ensued against my Lord the King." You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Good morning, friends. My name is Pastor Ryan. I'm so glad that you've joined us online this morning for our worship service. If you've been following along with us, you know that we have been in uh, the book of Daniel 
and I have called this series Unshakable. How do you live in a culture where your uh, convictions in God collide with that culture? And we've looked at some uh, kind of some principles from Daniel's life to see how he has lived in a culture that really challenged his faith. We've also, within the book of Daniel so far, we've seen the amazing action of God Almighty. And this morning we are in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, it's 36 verses. It's a lengthy chapter. I hope that you'll read it today or read along with us today. Um, and, and, and it's so lengthy that I've decided to split this talk up this morning uh, into, into two parts. So this is like part one. And the title of my message today is A Testimony from a Pagan King. On that note, I want to ask you a question. If I invited you to come to church or to uh, uh, some gathering, maybe during uh, midweek, to listen to a pagan king, would you come? Uh, not only would you come, but would you listen to him? Would you perhaps take his advice? Um, I can only assume your answer. Many of us might say, yeah, I might come. I might be curious about that. Or no way I would never do that. Take advice from a pagan king. Never. Well, Daniel 4 is this unique chapter in which it might be, uh, you, can, you can look this up, fact check this, it might be the only chapter in the whole Bible written by a pagan king. If it's not the only chapter, uh, it is a chapter here written by a pagan king. And I think in my mind, how could God allow a, a pagan king to write a whole chapter in, in his holy word? And the only thing I can come up with, friends, is if God would allow that to be in his scripture, then there's something in here that is for us and that we need to pay attention to and that we can, can learn from from. Uh, uh, one famous pastor once said, I, I always uh, love this quote, is that armed with enough humility, you can learn anything from someone. And here we're learning uh, from a pagan king, King Nebuchadnezzar. So this is, this is his, his testimony, what God has, has done in his life. Uh, if you've been following through uh, with us in this series, you know that God, uh, little by little, uh, has been revealing himself to, uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar through, through Daniel, uh, and how Daniel was able to interpret a dream for him, and through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how uh, they wouldn't bow down to him, and how God dramatically uh, delivered them from a fire. And so God has been at work in a major way, revealing himself. And, and maybe God is at work in your life today too, revealing himself to you. And so this is the testimony of this king and what God has done in his life. Look at the first three verses here in chapter four. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show you the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. This is astounding, friends. This king is now saying, this evil, wicked king who is responsible for, for um, killing people, uh, taking people apart from limb to limb, is now saying, I want everyone in the whole earth, all languages, I want you to hear me talk about this most high God. I thought I was the Most High God, but I want to tell you what this Most High God has done for me. Uh, at one time in my life, friends, he's saying that I thought I was the Most High. But now, I want to tell you something. I've been humbled, and I want to tell you that there's someone even higher than me. You know, one, possibly one of the, the greatest revelations that you and I can have is 
that we are not God. <laughs> that there is a most high God and we are not him. And King Nebuchadnezzar has this real, realization that he is not the one that is calling the shots in his life. I know that is a, a great realization that, that I need to have almost every day, that I am not the one that calls the shots. There's someone higher than me. And God does something unpleasant to King Nebuchadnezzar here that we're going to learn about in this chapter. Uh, and it, 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 it seems unpleasant to him. And even when I read this, because it has to do with discipline, uh, discipline is never, never pleasant. I don't know anyone who likes discipline. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Friends, it, it's so clear that God loves King Nebuchadnezzar so much. Though he was evil, God loves him. And it's so clear, friends, when I read God's word, that God loves you, God loves me so much that sometimes he has to humble us. He has to bring us real low to raise us back up again so that we might be able to see our true selves and see who God really is, the truth about who God is. And that's exactly what he has done here. Now, you heard Pastor Mac read the scripture to us, so I'm not going to go ahead and, and read all of this here today. I just mainly want to point out some things. Let me first summarize this, this dream because it's interesting. It's, it's strange, uh, to be frank with you. He has this dream in verses 9 through 18. You can read all about it. Uh, there was this huge tree in his dream and the top of it touched the sky. So we know it was really tall and it says it was visible to the ends of the earth and its leaves were visible. Uh, it, it had a lot of fruit on the tree. And so we imagine this kind of flourishing tree. It says that under its branches, uh, all the animals found shelter and, and birds lived under the branches. The second part of the dream, you know, the first part was this tree. The second part of the dream is that this holy messenger came uh, down from heaven and called from heaven uh, saying this, cut down the tree. Trim its branches, strip off all the leaves, scatter all the fruit, uh, just let the animals flee away. And then it said, but let the stump and the roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground. And then it kind of changes the language here and says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. You know, so constantly drenched with, with dew, uh, just constantly wet. It says, let him live with the animals. And then it says, let him or his mind be changed from a man to an animal till seven times pass by for him. This is really, really interesting. What is this word, uh, this word seven times, this phrase mean some people might, some people uh, think it might mean seven years. Some people uh, think it might be uh, seven seasons of whatever length of time, it's, it's, it's a long time. It's longer than just a month. Um, and, and so what, what God, the message that God is sending uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in this is that uh, he was going to show him how dangerous and destructive his pride was. It was destroying his life. And also, within this uh, passage of scripture here, he's saying, if you do not change your ways, then some, this is what's going to happen. And we'll, and we'll, we'll talk about that, 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 what exactly that was. But let me ask you another question. What percentage of people are destroyed by suffering? Suffering is hard. And I know that there, there are some people that might uh, be emotionally destroyed by it. But I know that when I am suffering, 
I tend to be so close with Jesus, so close with God. I begin to call out to God all the more, and I know him all the more, and through suffering, I am close. And so I would uh, say that I think through suffering, um, we're not so much destroyed by it. We're, we're lifted up. It's really interesting. We're lifted up by God, and we're drawn closer to God if we, if we call out to him. I remember the book of James, where the book of James tells us that um, we actually become mature and complete through suffering. So suffering has this amazing good purpose in our lives. Um, but pride, what God is showing King Nebuchadnezzar, is totally different. You see, um, I wonder what percentage of people are destroyed by success. What percentage of people are destroyed by fame? I remember reading a book when I was in college by one of my professors. He wrote a book about some notable athletes. And I remember reading about these athletes. It, it wasn't really their suffering that uh, brought destruction on their lives. It was their fame. It was their success that they had in their life. And that's exactly what's happening to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, listen to this great piece of wisdom from Proverbs 27, verse 21. It says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but people are tested by their praise. People are tested by just how much praise you give them. It's good to give praise. We should give praise where, you know, to people. We should compliment people. But that does sometimes... If we're not careful, it's not the person's fault who's giving you that praise. It's our fault for uh, how we receive that. Sometimes our pride can well up. Listen to that same passage from Eugene Peterson, The Message. It says, The purity of silver and gold is tested by putting them in the fire. The purity of the human heart is tested by giving them a little fame. And that is totally describes. It brings King Nebuchadnezzar's life into to reality. Uh, his father, King Nebuchadnezzar's father, uh, senior, was the king of Babylon, junior, who we're talking about, was the general in his father's army, and junior was responsible for um, conquering the Assyrian Empire, who was the most powerful empire at that time. And when his dad died, Junior becomes king and he builds Babylon into the greatest empire. And there are some things that began to well up in his life that caused problems. And I want to look at two of those problems today. Problem number one. You can read about it in, in verses 17, 25, and 32. Here's the first problem. King Nebuchadnezzar does not see that God... Uh, is almighty and sovereign in all the kingdoms. He does not see God as one who is almighty and sovereign in all the kingdoms. Now, remember when something is repeated more than once in Scripture, we should pay attention to it. Uh, and this theme of what I just said is repeated three times. First in verse 17, it says, The decision is announced by the messengers. This is talking about the dream he had. The Holy One declares the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This dream is given so that King Nebuchadnezzar would come to this understanding that he is not the Most High, that God is the Most High, and he's sovereign over all kingdoms. Verse 25, the same thing. It says, until you acknowledge, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to humble you until you acknowledge that the Most High is so sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 32, it, it says, your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people, and it gets real bad here for him. You'll be driven away from people and will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge 
at the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. That's his first problem. He does not think that God is sovereign. Remember in chapter 1, we learned that the king acknowledges that, that Daniel is ten times more capable than any other magician or enchanter in the world because David trusted God and did not eat the king's food, right? And, and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that, but he still has not come to this understanding and this belief in his heart that God is almighty. In chapter 2, uh, we, we learned that Daniel was able to interpret this dream, right? And King Nebuchadnezzar said, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. But even then, he still does not acknowledge that God is most high and that he's sovereign over all kingdoms, over everything. He has not come to that understanding. In chapter 3, again, God keeps showing up to him. God keeps showing up. And I just wonder how much God keeps showing up to our lives, to where we just totally ignore him. God keeps showing up to him, but he keeps on um, believing that he is king. Chapter 3, right? He, he puts Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he puts them in the, the blazing furnace, and God delivers. He, he does this miracle, and God delivers. But he still does not confess that he, is, that he is king, that God is sovereign over all. And that's the problem. That's problem number one. King Nebuchadnezzar needs to learn that he's not calling the shots. That's the problem sometimes in my life. I need to learn that I am not the one calling the shots. God is. God is. He's in control. This leads me to the second problem that King Nebuchadnezzar had. It's the problem of pride. Look at verse 4. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in, I'm going to put a stress on this, my palace, contented and prosperous. Now, there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. There's nothing wrong with, in the King James Version, I think it puts it like this, there's nothing wrong with flourishing. But there is something totally wrong with thinking that we are the ones that have caused us to flourish. There is something wrong with thinking that we are the ones uh, who have been able to prosper by, by our own hands, as if God has had nothing to do with it. And it's clear that Nebuchadnezzar believes, or believed at one time, that his life of ease was due to his own hands. Look at verses 29 and 30. It says 12 months later. Now this was after he has this dream and after Daniel interprets what this dream means. He says 12 months later as the king, I was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. He said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power, and for the glory of my majesty. <laughs> Total pride wells up in him, and everything is about him and what he has built. If you remember in chapter 3, he built that statue, which we can only assume it was a statue of him, and he told people to bow down and, and worship him. He thinks he is God. Uh, uh, again, in chapter 3, remember I just referenced it when he threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire for not bowing down. He said, I'm going to give you another chance, but if you don't uh, take this chance and bow down, he said, then what God will be able to deliver you from my power? It's clear his problem is pride. Not long ago, one of my children asked me, does God hate anything? I mean, hate's a very strong word. And actually, God does. In Proverbs 16, verse 5, it says this, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Wow, what a strong word, detests. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Ouch. In the English Standard Version, 
the language is a bit stronger. It says, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination, abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So do you get the picture? God does hate something. God hates pride. There's a great book, if you've never read it, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. He calls pride the greatest sin or the great sin. He said this, here's how pride works. Whenever we measure ourselves against other people, even people in the community, on any number of factors with the goal of feeling superior to someone else, this is pride. In our pride, we may focus on how our vocational or educational accomplishments are superior to others. Friends, pride is so dangerous because it causes us to be consumed with ourselves rather than being consumed with God. Remember, even Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love one or hate the other. C.S. Lewis goes on to write this, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, this is really good, you cannot see something that is above you. C.S. Lewis hit the nail on the head with exactly where King Nebuchadnezzar is at, exactly his problem. He is so consumed with himself and what he has built, he cannot even look above and see God Almighty who is sovereign over all kingdoms. He needs to be consumed with God. Friends, it's so easy, I know, uh, for us to look at King Nebuchadnezzar and point out his sin. Uh, It's so easy for us to desire to hear sermons about other people's sin, not ours. Uh, We're often blind to pride in our own life. But God here points us out. He uses this pagan king to point something out that every one of us struggles with. And it's something that we all have to... uh, 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 look at in our lives. We can't be blind to it anymore. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. We're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work in us. And that's exactly where King Nebuchadnezzar is at. He's, he's still trying to interfere uh, uh, with, with uh, what God really is trying to do in him. And he is blind to all the pride. And that's when God gives him this dream. And this dream really is God's divine mercy to pull Nebuchadnezzar out of his pride. For him to be able to see God for who he is. Really, God's discipline is his divine mercy in our lives. Friends, we don't have to fall into pride. Here's the good news. We do not have to fall into pride. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 reminds us that God always provides a way out of temptation. Always provides a way out from falling into sin. Let me just read it for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God's faithful. He's here to help us and lift us up out of pride so we don't make these same mistakes as this pagan king. So, in my uh, in our remainder, remaining time we have together this morning, I want to just touch on some areas. How can we begin to overcome pride? And we're going to look at it today, and we're going to look at it next Sunday. But how can we begin to overcome pride with, of course, God, the Holy Spirit, being our helper? The first thing I want to say is um, resist. Resist comparing yourself to others. Instead of, um, you know, seeing ourselves sometimes as um, 
a masterpiece of how God created us. We look at other people and we say, oh, man, I wish I was like them. Or why can't I be as good as them? Or perhaps we look at uh, things that other people have and say, why do they have that? I'm so much better than them. I deserve that. Friend, that's, that's pride. That's pride. And, and it can lead you down a path of destruction that it led King Nebuchadnezzar. God made you. He loves you. The Bible says, calls you his masterpiece, his workmanship. He loves you. Resist the temptation to compare your life and yourself to other people. The second thing is this, real quickly, is resist the temptation to be defensive. You know, when you are wrong, it is possible, number one, that you are wrong, and it is possible uh, for you to admit that you're wrong. You see, pl- pride blinds us to when we're, when we're wrong. Pride, pride blinds us to where we're not able to see our own faulty thinking. As I said, we're so good at pointing out the sins of others. We're so good at pointing out uh, where someone else is wrong, but we're not very good sometimes at pointing out where we are wrong. Resist the temptation to be defensive. The, second, the third thing is here, I would also say resist um, the me first, what I'm calling the me first temptation. How many of you that when someone takes a picture of you and uh, perhaps a, a large group of people, uh, when you go to look at that picture on your phone or on Facebook or wherever you view that picture nowadays, uh, who do you look for first? Uh, maybe I'm the only one. I go right to myself. Oh, how do I look? I, I hope they got the best side of me, right? Uh, and, and that, uh, frankly, um, plays a part in our everyday lives. We, we tend to look out for ourselves first. It's the me first temptation. That is not the way of Jesus, friends. Uh, when I read scripture, I'm challenged by Jesus every time he says to love him and to love others. It's always about loving others first. So resist those temptations. And I think when we resist those temptations, pride begins to to, to fall away. So that's something we can do with the Lord being our helper is to resist. But I would also call you to do this today. In closing, I would call you to pray. To pray First, to pray for humility. Pray that God would help you to be humble. You know, Jesus loved us so much. Philippians talks about how he humbled himself. And he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he, he left heaven. He came and dw- lived on earth. Uh, he moved into our neighborhood and became human. He humbled himself says he took on the very form of a servant, even dying for us. And the way of Jesus is the way of humility. Pray for humility. Pray and ask God for that. Seek to walk as Jesus walked. And when we seek that, pride begins. God begins to do a great work in our life, just as he did with King Nebuchadnezzar. The second thing here I would call you to pray is, is for grace. Ask God to give you more grace and more grace that even when you might disagree with someone, you love them and you give them grace. That you love others as you love yourself. Have you noticed it's, 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 it's somehow difficult today to have a conversation. It seems like no one can agree with anyone. I think that we can come under the way of Jesus and learn how to give grace. And I think when we pray for humility, when we pray for grace, that we'd be able to give grace to others and love other people as we love ourselves. pride begins to go away. And the third and final thing this morning is this. Pray for more dependence on God. I think naturally we are independent people. We love our independence. We don't naturally like people telling us 
what to do. But here's the thing, when we're dependent on God, it takes the pressure off of us. When we wrap ourselves in Jesus, it takes all the pressure off me and puts it all on Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants us to do any, anyway, friends. He invites me, he invites you. He says, cast all of your cares onto me because I care for you. Friends, resist temptation. Pray for humility. Pray for more grace. And pray that you might become more, not independent, but more dependent on God. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this testimony of this pagan king. God, thank you that we can read this today. I never thought that you would speak through this pagan king to me. And God, I pray that you would use it in the lives of those who are listening right now, Lord Jesus. And God, we would all, in these quiet moments, wherever we're at, surrounded by some friends or family, or maybe even just by ourselves, we would have a conversation with you. If there's pride that, we ident that you help us identify, would we just confess it as sin? And then, God, would you help us replace that sin with a, a passion to follow your way of humility, to follow your way of grace, and to follow your way of loving others as we love ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Friend, if you're here today and, and God has spoken to you, we want to know about that. Go ahead and send our church an email. If you're someone here today and says, you know what? I need to confess this sin of pride. Uh, reach out to us. There's a button that you can click on the website if you're watching it through the website. And I want to help you uh, follow Jesus. We love you and we'll see you next Sunday as we continue this um, talk on a testimony from a pagan king. Mm -hmm.